Welcome back. It is Wednesday, August the 14th. Uh, my guest in this segment is uh, Chris Cook. And Chris, uh, besides being involved with uh, Pacific Free Press, you also have a radio program. And we're going to talk about some of the issues that are some of the guests that you've had on your radio program over the last month or so, starting with something that happened on Pender Island. I don't know anything about this, but I've seen it mentioned in the Times columnist a few times. Well, it's nice to see you again, Jack. Happy Thank you summer. very much. You, Happy you know, I, uh, as somebody that hosts people, you know, hosts shows, I always remember August as being, next to December, the most difficult time to book people. You know, people are on holidays and the news is slow. They used to call it the, uh, the silly season in the press. I don't know if they still do that, but it's been busy as ever and things are happening all the time. And over the last month and a half or so on Guerrilla Radio, I've had uh, a lot of uh, British Columbia-based uh, guests on talking about BC-based stories, and it was never really a design, but my email box would fill up with people, uh, you know, giving me the outrage du jour of what's going on in our own province, and I really felt compelled to talk about it. And as you mentioned, North Pender was, uh, I did a program last week with Mark Benson, and uh, Mark's with the Save Razor Points Water Action Group that he formed. He's a resident over there. And it all surrounds uh, Gardam Pond. And Gardam is the fourth largest water source on uh, Pender. And if you, anybody who's been to the Gulf Islands, you know that the water, fresh water, is, is a really serious issue. It's in short supply everywhere, uh, you know, on every single island, and even this island, too. But um, on Pender, Gardam Pond represents the fourth largest water body on the island. But more importantly, according to Mark, is that it charges the aquifer under the island there, where all the you know fresh drinking water is coming from. So when you say charges the aquifer, you mm. mean water from Garden Pond is and other is, places, but it sinks down into okay. the groundwater okay. and ch by charging it, you know, replenishes the the ground the the water table there. Okay. This is really important because it is an island, and there's salt water under it. Always, you know trying to reassert itself and where it actually is reasserting itself in certain parts of uh, the island. They're worried that the, act, the main aquifer, if it's not getting properly recharged, the water lens, the fresh water lens that keeps the salt water at bay will, will lose its ability, will allow the seepage of salt water okay. to come up. And once that happens, then your drinking, your source water is gone. It's irrevocable, you know? So, they asked, uh, and he, with his Save Razor Points Water Action Committee, they asked the CRD, the body responsible for, uh, for the dam that creates, uh, or created Garden Pond, they asked that before anything drastic was done, that they did a proper groundwater study uh, to, just, to discover what effect on the aquifer removing the pond would have. So they were talking about drain, the CRD was talking about draining the pond. They, want to drain, they wanted to drain the pond because it's an earthen dam and it's uh, been deemed, uh, you know, that it it's poses a hazard okay. to residents down, you know, downhill and, uh, and nobody disputes that the dam, the dam needed to be refurbished, but the CRD decided that it would be too expensive to do that they didn't want to take responsibility to take over uh, the water license for the dam, the liabilities in case something did happen. Their easiest solution was to drain it, uh, which they have done. Now, since I talked to Mark, they began draining, the CRD began draining the lake. When the, when the coalition of residents, and they're supported too by uh, members of the island's trust trustees, and support, you know, this just slowing things down and doing a proper study. Uh, and the Green um, uh, MLA uh, uh, um, Olson, uh, he also uh, came on board trying to get this thing to slow down, but it was disregarded. But even at that time, uh, Mark tells me that they said, well, at least if you're gonna go ahead with this draining uh, um, uh, effort, at least drain it onto the land so that it can, you know, seep back into the water table at some point. But the CRD decided that would be too, uh, too complicated for them to do. So they essentially they dumped two and a half million gallons of fresh water into the ocean, straight into the sea. Eighty-two percent of the contents of Garden Pond, 
Now, the pond, as well as you know, charging the aquifer and providing a nice place for people to go, there's wildlife issues there. There's blue listed. There's a couple of blue listed species on this pond as well. There doesn't seem to be a, 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 a cogent plan to. Uh, address this, uh, the red-legged, the, the North American red-legged frog being one of it, and cat, the cattail marsh, marsh that is a part of the pond ecosystem as well. Both of these blue listed, and both of these now, according to Mark, now that the water is down, is you know turning into a mire, and they haven't heard the frogs since the draining uh, um, uh, operation began. So, boy, oh boy, all these, you know. Running the world is a difficult thing. <laughs> Just to ask the CRD. <laughs> yeah, I will say one thing about the CRD. When they say something, you never really know if that's the truth of what they're up to or it's something completely different. I don't know anything about this issue, but I do know that about the CRD. Well, so. and, and Mark reported the same. When, they said, when the CRD made a claim that it would cost $1.5 million to uh, shore up this dam and, and keep the pond intact, uh, they were pressed to say, well, where did, where did you get those numbers? He knew, he knew engineers who took a look at this and said, well, no, that, that doesn't sound right at all. When pressed, the CRD had to admit that they actually didn't have any quotes. This $1.5 million was something that they you know, sort of brought out of a hat based on an entirely different scenario. They hadn't had engineers go and, and give them an actual quote. They just used a figure uh, a ballpark figure, as it turns out, and one that is way higher than the um, the engineers that uh, Mark uh, Benson talked to. He could have told the provincial government, who are currently spending ten billion dollars, ten billion dollars oh. to build Site C. I mean, there's money around. If it, I'll just say why I don't trust the CRD about. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first issues I ever worked on was back in the early 1990s. The CRD. The water, the water board actually faked a water shortage in the city of Victoria. They told us we had a water shortage, and we did, but only because they had created it by draining some reservoirs. So they created a water shortage and then told us we had to expand our water reservoir because we had a water shortage. That's the way they operate sometimes. So that's why I, don't, I never trust anything they say. How can you believe these? I mean, it's a completely different group of people, but things don't seem to change. I mean, they just mislead us and misinform us when, when, when they want to. And you get the feeling that the commissioners don't even know what's going on. They're kind of manipulated by the staff sometimes. So it's, it's a strange situation. Well, when you mention the province, the, I mean, the province, uh, uh, the Islanders, the North uh, uh, or Pender Islanders, appealed to the province as well to for redress and to slow this down. They didn't find any allies there as well. And and another story, Jack, I worked on uh, uh, just recently. I had uh, Heather McSwan and Barbara Nickel on the show, and they they live in Glade out in the West Kootenays, and they uh, are with the Glade Watershed Protection Society. And in the in the watershed there has been allowed uh, uh, logging to take place. I mean, you might be surprised to know in all the watersheds, and you know, there's been that recent uh, Auditor General's report slamming provincial governments present and past in their handling of fresh water issues in the province. Uh, in this case, they've, uh, they've allowed that logging companies go into the watershed. The, the people there are, are very worried about this, as they rightly should be. They've now, when you're talking about the watershed, you're talking about their drinking water. This is the source. Uh, this is the source of their drinking of water. water for the, drinking water and agricultural uh, um, uh, water f to for their crops. And, and they um, they took this to the Supreme Court of British Columbia, and the question in their challenge was. Well, do British Columbians have the right to clean water? Now, there's a terrific article by Sarah Cox at the narwhal.ca, a, a fine publication, online publication, uh, based in British Columbia. Uh, th these guys do really great work, and, and it's a super uh, source. But um, they took this to the, to the Supreme Court, and Sarah Cox outlines this in her article. And... Um, uh, asking just that very question, do British Columbians have a right to their own, uh, or to clean drinking water? And uh, the justice, uh, one of the B BC uh, Supreme Court justices, uh, Mark McEwen, he says, and I'll quote him, 
uh, do you have the right to clean water in this rhetorical way? I'd suggest you don't. There's, there just is nowhere in the law where you can look and say, there it is, there's my right. I have a right to clean water. And this was his, his statement in the court, his attitude, and the, um, well, the they judge, lost their case. Yeah, I can, but the judge's role is just to interpret, the, I mean, if the law doesn't say it, then it's true. What he's saying is true. Now, the law, of course, should give us the right to clean drinking water. It's completely insane that we don't have it, <laughs> but we don't, and we don't. But the, the companies have the right to clear-cut log our watersheds. Well, seems. there's only two watersheds in British Columbia where logging and industrial activity is prohibited. That's here in Victoria and in Vancouver. Everywhere else, it's pretty much open season. And one of the reasons that it's not allowed in Victoria and it's not allowed in Vancouver that, coincidentally, those are the two jurisdictions that control their watersheds that it's not private interests that control the water supply for the population. You know, it's funny you should say that, Chris, because at the same time as they fake that water shortage, just before that, the CRD itself was running a commercial logging operation in our drinking watershed, and a group of citizens had to go to court, to the B.C. Supreme Court, to stop them. And they did win that case, because in our case, the CRD had no right to do it, but they were doing it. They were running a commercial logging operation in our watershed. That's how bizarre the CRD and all of our local governments and provincial and federal. Well, and yes, have, and the provincial everything. government is in the logging business too. They have BC timber sales. And I talked recently to Joe Foy of the Wilderness Committee about the Spotted Owl. Uh, five or less individuals remain in the Fraser Canyon Spotted Owl. Uh, population. Their habitat is being sold off and logged at this very moment. Uh, they need the big trees. They need the old, go old growth forest. That's being logged away. Um, and the trees, and it's, it's, it's being done with deals with the BC timber sales, which is the provincial government. And, and Joe was flabbergasted to see that the government was actually uh, uh, facilitating the extirpation of a species that is on the Sarah list, the species at risk uh, list here. Why would Joe be flabbergasted about that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess he, maintain, he maintains a, a little bit of uh, optimism yet, I suppose. I don't know, but yeah. you know, it, it's- Time to wake up everybody. It's, well, uh, uh, you know, it, it, so, you know, they, um, uh, then there's fracking. I mean- And we've only got two minutes left, so you know, well, fracking. Uh, I think we've got even less than two minutes left metaphorically in this province when it comes to water issues. We, you see on, the, on the, the CRD level, the provincial level, the federal level, uh, everywhere we look, uh, water is being treated like dirt, you know? I mean, it's the, the fracking, uh, your, the previous guest on this program talked about that, uh, is, is a tremendous uh, destroyer of fresh water. Uh, and that's just one of the many, the, you know, the pipelines as well, and, and what we see here with logging and industrial activity and, and watersheds across this province. And that is only increasing because the timber, you know, the, the cutters are coming closer and closer to populated areas because they're running out of, you know, uh, uh, saleable timber and, the, and they're desperate to get more and more. And, and they're being allowed to walk, you know, right up to the, you know, the, almost the property lines of people to get their timber Absolutely. into the watersheds. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely, yeah. That's the reality of the nation we live in. And if we don't like it, then we have to change the people who run our country. And mm -hmm. I don't mean Justin Trudeau or John Horgan, because they're not the people who run our country. The people who run our country are the people we never hear of. We have our own deep state and it's the billionaires and uh, the international corporations and the logging people and the fracking people. Well, if we can get together on, the, on a local level, you know, I talked to June Ross and June's with the Vancouver Island Water Watch Coalition. She edits their website, VancouverIslandWaterWatchCoalition.ca. Locals have to, you have to get it where you live, you have to stand against, you know, you got to stand up and, fi and fight and preserve your own little piece of ground, yeah. you know, is, in my view. You can get information from organizations like that, the norwall.ca, a great publication, 
focusonline.ca, one of the finest magazines in the country, I think, yeah. right here in Victoria. Yeah. Policyalternative.ca. Ben Parfit's got a piece from the, that's the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. His recent piece just out captured British Columbia's Oil and Gas Commission and the case for reform sold out to the frackers, you know, in his view. Um, you know, but, pe you know, the people have to get out in the streets. You've got to stand where you live. Chris, we're metaphorically and realistically <laughs> out of time. So thank you very much. Well, thanks again for yeah. having me, Jack. It's always great talking yeah. to you. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.